Good morning, everybody. I'm Cathy Samaris. I'm an endocrinologist. I should explain what that is. Um, I'm a hormone physician, and my great clinical interest is in diabetes and all of the conditions that it uh, associates with, predominantly obesity. But in my little journey um, through clinical practice and through my research, um, I've managed to observe a number of things about the way diabetes um, affects people. And one of these um, effects, which is quite concerning, is uh, dementia. So let's, let's talk about that and why is it relevant and what can we do about it and what can we learn and apply from diabetes. So what we know about diabetes uh, is that it is associated with based on different studies, a three to five times increased risk of dementia. Now we're all worried about dementia. Dementia is that condition where not only do we lose our memory and our judgment and our independence, we are robbed of some of the most important things that we have. And whilst we might think about our house and our car and about family members, really our identity is very much based on our memories and how that, that sort of puts together the world as we recall it, the world as we live it today. And certainly diabetes doesn't, sorry, dementia does not only rob the individual of the very rich life that they've had, but it robs their family members of the person that they have. So let's talk about dementia in diabetes. We think that it's at least associated with, the, uh, with vascular disease heart disease, hypertension and stroke, and these are very important factors. But there are other very important factors such as insulin resistance, which underlies the majority of cases of, of adult onset diabetes. Now insulin resistance is where insulin just does not work to lower the glucose level. And the problem with that is that you can have um, insulin that circulates, you can have insulin deficiency, both factors whether you have an excessive insulin or not enough insulin, can affect neurological health, the way our cells inter interrelate with each other, how they signal, how they um, start another ca uh, cascade of electricity in the brain, nutritional changes in the brain, and, and how that manifests in memory and judgment um, and executive function, deciding which brand of yogurt you're going to buy, for example deciding that you have to pay this bill before that bill. So it's not just, I can't remember that phone number and remind me the name of that person. It's these tiny little things that we execute every day in life that allows us to live in our community and interact with it. So insulin resistance is, is really quite important. It's basic in type 2 diabetes, but it has a role in, in Alzheimer's disease. So. If we talk about Alzheimer's disease, we know that about 80% of people, I just, there we go, 80 of people with Alzheimer's disease will have either diabetes or insulin resistance. So this was one of the things that when I was kind of looking at my older patients and realizing that they're okay, they're, they're not functioning as well as they used to, they're not remembering to take their medications properly, they're not judging um, the amount of different carbohydrates, for example, in the foods that they need to eat, which is critical to diabetes management. Um, a large proportion of people with Alzheimer's will have this insulin resistance or diabetes. So the diabetes, the glucose side, is really very critical. When we look at actually dementia, Alzheimer's is the large proportion of it, but we have other causes. And the vascular side, again, accounts for up to about 30% of all cases of, of dementia. Then we also have Lewy body disease, which seems to be associated with Parkinson's disease. And finally, we have this rare type of dementia or less common type of dementia called frontotemporal dementia, which not a lot of is known about apart from um, the role of alcohol and diabetes in developing that. So if we're looking at the factors that are involved in erasing our memories, we really need to look at nutrition in the brain, and a big part of that is glucose, of course. So if we talk about dementia, yes, of course, genetics play a big role. And one of the key uh, genes that has been uh, found to be a susceptibility gene for dementia is a gene that involved, that regulates lipid metabolism, 
blood fat metabolism and that's called apolipoprotein E type epsilon 4 gene. And in all of our studies we actually measure that gene um, to see whether people carry that because it does increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease markedly. And so that is a genetic susceptibility that we can easily measure and know about and be prepared for. But one of the other really important aspects is nutrient supply. And so let's think about this as not only blood supply, blood supply to the brain is obvious, this is why stroke and, and cerebrovascular disease promotes dementia, but we need to think about other nutrients, not only blood fats, high cholesterol for example is associated with accelerated brain aging, but think very much about glucose. And how can we think about changes in brain metabolism as we age? I like this slide because we can think about ourselves at different stages of life through growth in, in spring through down to autumn. Now if you're a gardener you know that at this point these two points of the um, tree cycle you don't go dumping manure under this tree it's going to die if you do and the brain is very much like that if you have an excess of nutrient after the rapid growth phase, you are actually going to promote the cellular aging pathways. When you have too much nutrition, your cells have to process those nutrients, whether they're glucose, whether they're protein, or whether they're um, blood fats. You have to process that, and in doing that, you wear out this machinery that runs your cells. Marina showed us a beautiful slide of, um, of the metabolic pathways within a cell. You're just going to force those cells to have to work really hard to process that nutrient. And so, you know, if we, if we look at this average Australian person, um, and um, sadly it's not quite the way Michelangelo um, uh, presented him, but this is kind of average or a restrained version of what we see today in Australia. And if we peel back David's skin and have a look at what's happening at a cellular level. So if you have too much nutrient on board, too much energy on board, which is essentially if you have an excessive fat, what happens is that you have elevated fats circulating in the blood, um, you have elevated blood glucose levels, and um, what the glucose does is it attaches itself to proteins and makes them very inflammatory and we can call those aged, aged glycation end products. You may know some of them as radical oxidative stress proteins. That's a common thing that vitamin companies exploit to people to get them to buy their vitamins, clear all those oxidative stress um, factors. The quickest way of getting all your oxidative stress markers is to just go on a quick little fast. Okay, That's the quickest way to get those oxidative stress markers down. You basically you don't starve the body, but you just reduce the nutrient load it has to deal with. The problem with having an excess of this is it stresses our cells, obviously, and that creates inflammation. And inflammation is, if you like, the white ant of your body's building. And it's going to eat away and erode all of the structures that, um, that give us health and give us long life. And what happens in the brain is that you have interference um, with the links between one neuron and the other. So here we have um, the glucose, the lipid, the inflammatory molecules getting through the blood-brain barrier into the neuronal cells in our brains. And what they'll do is, you know, it's, it's a very nice organization of cells. The cells link one with the other. We have these other um, immune cells in the brain that act as regulators. And it interferes with some of these um, long connections from one neuron to the other. And these can not only become disentangled, but they can become and, and disconnected. But you can have these things developing called neurofibrillary tangles, which actually get in the way of, um, of cells linking with each other because the neurons have got some regenerative capacity, but their ability to link back up with each other gets lost because of all of these tangles. Um, you have these cytokines. You have um, these um, immune cells that should be regulating and keeping everything nice and healthy, but they're subject to so much stress 
they can act in an inflammatory way themselves and they can promote the inflammation. So then if we look at what's happening in dementia at a, at a cellular level, you have these fibrils developing, amyloid is one of these um, proteins, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about amyloid in a minute, and you have these plaques developing which interfere with the neurons linking one to the other. Um, the amyloid can be cleared, okay? And the way you can do this is by having good insulin signaling. So when you have insulin um, resistance, you don't efficiently process and remove the amyloid. So we have, um, we talked about those immune cells. Those immune cells can break down the amyloid and actively remove them. But if you are insulin resistant, this process is impaired. And so with insulin resistance in the brain, closely associated with other processes of diabetes in the body, you have an accumulation of this amyloid and that promotes those processes that age the brain much more rapidly and re re uh, lead to that functional decline. And we can actually measure this. So um, these are um, PET amyloid scans, um, very expensive to do, rather very difficult. Um, I'm doing these in, in, in some of my studies and um, you have to actually have the, um, the isotope jetted up from the laboratory in Melbourne with a very, very short time frame of getting it from Sydney Airport to um, the laboratory where we um, do the scanning. And then it's infused into the person. So we've got hours window only to do these scans. Otherwise, we've wasted the very expensive isotope. And you can see um, that the amyloid is, you know, the, the bright green here. Um, and you can see how much more there is in somebody who has got um, dementia developing. And the amyloid is present in very small quantities very early on. So in, when there's um, mild cognitive impairment, which is a pre-dementia um, kind of syndrome that can be uh, tested for and evaluated and measured very uh, and quantified very, very carefully. And you start to see amyloid being deposited in the brain when you have early cognitive loss uh, change. And as you start to lose more and more memory, you start to see that there is more and more buildup of the green and the yellow and the red within the brain. Now, I didn't pick this plant because it's purple and that's the Garvin's favourite colour. <laughs> but it's French lilac. And what has lilac got to do with all of this? So one of the most critically important first line and old and safe and now very cheap medications we use to treat diabetes every single day. We use it in young people, we use it in pregnant women, we use it in almost every single person with type 2 diabetes. It's actually derived from Galenga officinalis, the Latin name for French lilac, and that drug is metformin. Okay, so metformin comes from this flower, and I use it every day in clinical practice. Um, we also use it in non-diabetes conditions, such as polycystic ovary syndrome. We use it in obesity. It's been shown to have uh, reduced the rates of incidence, cancer, and heart disease in people with diabetes. And now it's being used as an adjunct in some cancers with good data, for example, in breast cancer. So we're terribly interested in this old, safe, botanical derivative. And just to show you the scientific breakdown of it, so this, of course, is a beautiful botanical illustration from 100 years ago through the various life cycles um, and germination process of metformin. And this is where we derive it from. And in one of my studies, the Sydney Memory and Aging Study, which is um, 1,037 people, I don't know, are there any Sydney Memory and Aging Study participants here? No, because we, we wrote to everybody, yes, there are. Well, thank you very much for all your contributions. Um, let me show you some of the, um, the data from, that we've got from that study. So everybody in Wentworth electorate was invited to participate in this study perhaps about eight or nine years ago. And um, we had 1,037 people that came into the study and we followed most of them um, over a period of time. 
um, inviting them to come back every two years to have more evaluations, MRIs of the brain. We put people through a very rigorous memory testing process. We take blood and we've been measuring um, these every, every two years. And we've got data that have gone over a, a six year period. And what, um, and I've been looking at this data for uh, all that time and um, if uh, you kind of keep checking the Garvin's website in the next two to three weeks you'll see one of my papers on do statins make you stupid? You know, everybody's interested, do statin medications make you lose your memory? We've got a beautiful study coming up which Garvin will feature in the next couple of weeks showing that no, they don't, they actually protect your memory. Um, so that's, that's you know, one study. But what we've actually shown in that study over time is that people with diabetes lose cognition and memory much more rapidly than other people. And what we did was we looked in this data that I'm going to show you. So this is global cognition, which um, if you're part of that study, you would know we measured with lots of tests that look, took about two to three hours. Um, and we put together um, the global cognition, so this is looking at how, how well you retrieve memory short term, more, um, long term, um, how fast you process tasks, um, executive, executive function and judgment, um, how good your language, how complex and, and sophisticated your language was, and put it together for this global cognition score. And what we can see is um, here we have the group of people that have no diabetes, that's the grey line there. And then the dashed lines are for people with diabetes. The dashed line on top, which is almost identical to not having diabetes, are those people who are on metformin. And you can see the people that did also have diabetes but weren't treated with metformin had that sort of decline in their global cognition over a six year period. And we started to think, okay, maybe metformin has got a protective effect uh, in cognitive decline, but maybe also dementia. And so this is really hot off the press. Um, and so here we can see what happens to incident dementia rates in these people that are aged by now 76 to 96, um, as we've followed them. And the dark blue group here is, is these are Kaplan-Meier survival curves. So what it means is, you know, at, at the beginning, 100 people, 100% 100 of people were free of dementia because that was one of our um, entry criteria into the study. You couldn't have dementia if you went into the study. And you can see that over the period of time that there is a drop off and people were starting to develop dementia. And, you know, in our final follow up, um, you know, about 80% of people without diabetes were free of dementia. And if you had diabetes, it had this kind of drop off. So you can see that there was a, you know, a big drop off if you had diabetes, but you were not on metformin. And if you had diabetes and you were on metformin, you were a bit in between the two. So it seems to protect against the development of dementia in people who are at high risk, people with diabetes. So at Garvin, um, with our collaborators, we thought, um, with an extensive group of collaborators, we thought, why don't we do a study of people without diabetes to see whether we can stop the development of dementia. So this is the Met Memory study. And um, we were funded to do this. This was announced only about two months ago and we've been funded by the National Health and Medical Research Council to do this five-year study to try and prevent dementia in people who are showing early signs of dementia. And so with, um, uh, we start next year with um, a collaborative group. One of Garvin's great strengths is we collaborate very well with so many people um, across Australia, but also around the world. So with some of um, Australia's best um, uh, dementia researchers, Perminder Sashdev, um, uh, Henry Brudati, who are at UNSW, um, and with um, a team uh, who are at Columbia University in New York. We're running this study. It's going to be a randomized study. People have to have early dementia. They can't have dementia, but they have to be on their pathway. And we're going to basically, and they can't have diabetes, so it's, we're not going to have the diabetes effects coming here. But through changing the insulin resistance, which I've already talked about, which is the way metformin works, 
we are going to see if we can actually slow down that nutrient overload effect and reduce the inflammation and reduce the cognitive decline um, that characterizes insulin resistance. So we're going to be looking, of course, at the function of the brain through these very complicated two-hour patients taking um, uh, cognitive exercises. We're going to be looking at the brain anatomy using MRIs and those amyloid scans that I showed you. Um, and we're also going to look at the anti-aging properties of metformin. My own view is it links back to that idea of nutrient excess, the, the overweight David I showed you. If we have overloaded our bodies with nutrients, and really it can be raised by the, by the phase of the moon, by vestal virgins in organic soil. So don't buy into that um, um, hoo-ha about, oh, it's, it, it's so good that I'm going to eat lots of it. No, it's so good, it's great, but just eat a little amount. That's the key here. And don't think that you can reverse anti-aging by taking supplements, okay? I hope there are no um, industry people flogging supplements to people, good people like yourselves who are being exploited if you're paying um, lots of money for supplements. Please don't think that taking supplements can neutralize the effects of excess nutrients. You know, we have to come back to the way cells um, process excess nutrient, take the pressure off those cells and buffer it with things like metformin. Um, and really, I think what this study and it being funded shows is how committed the government is to investing in, in future health by looking at, our prop, at, at medications, old medications that we can refashion and repurpose um, to perhaps use as anti-aging and address some of the, the, the um, issues um, to do with our wonderful ageing population um, and keeping people youthful and active and engaged in the community. So just to close, when I'm assessing the health of my patients with diabetes, I always ask them, tell me about your diet. I always ask them, tell me about your exercise. And I always ask them, and what are you learning about now? And if I can leave you with one little hint, if you want to keep your brain healthy, eat right, eat little, eat right, and exercise the brain. And the best way to do that is to learn, build on the hobbies and the interests that you already have. Get into the fine print. Don't think that playing Sudoku and playing bridge, I mean, all that is learned and repetitive. You have to expand on your knowledge base. This can be adding tricky steps to your dancing um, already we've heard about how good dancing is, so you can add new twists and turns to your dancing if you play music, expand the repertoire. If you are a history buff, get into the fine print, be a truffle hunter and find the fine detail and build on the memory bank that you have. You can set up new neuronal circuitry that will help repair some of the damage that just everyday living does, but you have to exercise the brain. I thank you.